I never knew as I grew up about anti-Semitism or pain or want. It was a wonderful life. Although by today's comparison, it was really a small town. Nonetheless, it was a very fine town in the sense that culture of both uh, religious and secular was prevalent. It had a lovely, lovely school for boys and for girls, high schools, <clears throat> music schools. And although the Jews and the non-Jews lived separately, but there were occasions when they would intermingle. I've never experienced, until later on when the Hungarians took over, I never experienced personal anti-Semitism. I had Romanian friends. We lived in a very nice part of the city. The city itself was the capital of a province called Maramures. It had a tribunal. It, it was really a very nice, thriving city. In fact, it, by today's uh, standards, it is a well-known city because some important people came from my town. Uh, for instance, um, before I come to Elie Wiesel, for instance, the great violinist Sigeti came from Siget. Um, and there were other very well-known people, certainly in Hungary, that originated from Siget. It was a lovely town. It was at the foot of the Carpathian Mountains. We had four seasons, every season very special in and of itself. It was just beautiful. Were you close to your mother and father? I was very attached to both, but my father, I adored him, and he adored me. What was he like? Oh, God. He was so good and so sweet and very handsome. And I remember as a little girl, he had a mustache and he would kiss me and I would say, no, no, Apuka, you know, he shaved it. My mother was very serious and very studious. I remember her reading and we always teased her about it, ah, mommy. You read the paper from beginning from A to Z. And she did. She did. She used to tell me later on when things were getting already bad and I was old enough to know that things were going on with Hitler, this man. Uh, she was telling me, well, my Hungarian name is Baba. Babuka, take life seriously. I was taking piano lessons. And I was practicing at home for the next lesson. And she, would, she came in one day, and she watched me practice. And I looked at her, wondering why is she watching. When I finished, she said, you know, my dear Babuka, I wish you would take things seriously. You never know what life can bring. Maybe you'll have to earn a living. And teaching piano would be very nice. And I'm almost embarrassed to say, but the truth is, I straightened out and I looked at her and I said, Mommy, I should have to work. I mean, it was inconceivable. And this was in the middle 30s. I was already 10 years old. And it, come, it came back to me so many times later on. Until 19, uh, March 19, 1944. Hungarian, the total Hungarian jury was intact, 750,000. By, by 1944, March 19, the Russians were rolling closer and closer. It was post-Stalingrad, post-Leningrad. We saw, because at that time I was in a school in Kolozsvár, and we saw trains when I took the last train to go back to Siget. I saw trains full of German soldiers, Wehrmacht, coming from Russia. I mean, you it thought was, you were safe. That's right. It's going to be any time. God helped, you see, because there was a. I didn't. I, there is so much to tell, and it's so difficult to compress it. Siget was really divided. 
the religious side and the secular side. The secular side consisted of the merchants, the well-to-do people, and the lawyers, doctors. The religious side was Rabbi Teitelbaum, who was the big rabbi. They were praying. You see, they said, God heard our prayers. The Russians, no, first the prayer was for England and America will help. When they didn't, then they said, well, maybe, maybe the Russians will help. All right, so now the, Rus the Russians are going to help because they were on the other side of the Carpathian Mountains. And this is what we believed. We never heard or knew about the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, which was in April, a year, April 1943. You never heard of it? Never until after the war when I began to find out things. Never heard of it. Never heard of it of the Vilna Ghetto Uprising. Never heard of it. Never heard of it. There were rumors. You know, these crazy rumors. I mean, people don't do these things, all right? In any day, the war is going to be over. 1944. 1944. By that time, the bad things began. Like? Like, Jewish stores had to be closed, regardless, regardless. Professionals couldn't practice medicine or law or whatever. Jewish life came, came to a standstill. But the Hungarian gendarmes took over. Every week there was a razzia coming, not, interestingly, not the Nazis. I didn't see a Nazi, an SS man, until the train until we were taken to the train station. All Hungarian gendarmes, they had purple plumes in their helmets. They burst into homes, Jewish homes, took anything they wanted. Took from, from my parents' house silver, they took my bicycle, whatever, whatever they wanted. Now you were there or you were yeah, in no, Cluj? Yeah, no, no, I was back home. Okay, how frightening is this? I, it was very frightening. It was very frightening, plus the fact what really frightened us, my mother and me, because by this time one of my brothers, Alex, was in a labor brigade and my older brother was, was already home, but he lived far away from, you know, in a different section. Uh, my father was arrested by the Hungarian police. Were now, you there when that happened? Yes. Of, oh, God, was I there. I remember him. He was a very handsome man. And I remember walking him out tall. He, he was a tall man. And he turned back to hug me. My mother and I just stood there. We didn't know why he was arrested. In our street, there lived a very um, a lady aristocrat, a Hungarian lady aristocrat, who was very fond of me. I was a little girl. I used to play on her piano. My mother went to her and begged her, why did they take him away? She couldn't find out. Meanwhile, another, we lived in a very well-to-do neighborhood. Yes. How should I tell you? Yes, you know? I okay. my. my family was very well to do. Across from us, there was another uh, businessman, Nando Stern, who had another one of the big businesses. He was also taken away. Nobody knew why. I never knew why until after the war. Did you ever see your father again? No. No, I'm sorry. I saw him once in prison while somebody smuggled me out from the ghetto. So the Nazis came in March 19. It was early Pesach. Oh, and immediately they took half of our house, and they left us with a bedroom, a dining room, and a kitchen. The rest was requisitioned, and two German officers moved in there, young Wehrmacht or SS, I cannot tell. But what I do remember is the last Pesach that my father conducted in the bedroom, because we didn't have the dining room. 
suddenly there came, that's right, there came a law that anybody who is not a Hungarian, who doesn't have a Hungarian citizenship, will be taken to another place. We were Hungarian citizens. My father had his gold cross or whatever. But there were a couple of Polish people. And I know this because my brother was courting a very pretty girl, very pretty. I, I remember her really blue eyes, beautiful. And she was deported with her father. At that time, my brother wasn't there anymore because he was now in a Hungarian Jewish labor brigade, you know, the boys with the yellow bands. And several, and there was a train that these people were put in, assuring them you are going to be in a safe place. Several weeks later, the news swept the town that they were murdered on the way, which they were. Now, when the, this is where it comes in my, I, my, my feeling that when the reality becomes unbearable, you deny it. And I again remember what I heard. You know, the grown-ups speak. Who would do such a thing? It's ridiculous. It's not true. That's the only thing. Now, the mood was terrible. It was dark, but nobody said it. Nobody said it because the Russians were near the mountains. Across the mountains, we saw the mountains. And when we were in the ghetto at night, the youth went out and we sang because we heard the, the cannon fire. We couldn't imagine, we couldn't imagine that anything like that will happen. Then it was beyond comprehension. Then your father is taken. Now what's your mood? Now we are devastated. Why is Ternandor taken? What did he do? You know, I mean, the, the store was taken away from him too, from all the other Jews. But then we find out that there are nine Jews, including, she passed away not long ago, a dear, the father of a dear friend of mine, one of the great Zionists in town, who warned the Jews, who warned Rabbi Teitelbaum, tell the Jews to pack and go. And he said, if God would want us to be in Jerusalem, in Jerusalem, we would be in Jerusalem. All right? Again, that's another part. We found out that there were nine people arrested. So if nine people are arrested, and Dr. Fried, who was this great Zionist leader, Transylvanian leader, and Stern Andor and Fishman Andor, you know, very reputable people. I don't know all the other people who were arrested. Maybe they are keeping them for some reason. Wait, the war will be over soon. The Russians are across the mountains. Somehow there was always hope. That's, that was, this is what makes me angry when I hear people talk about hope. Hope couldn't get you a piece of bread, a, a morsel of bread, when hunger, when I was hungry in Auschwitz, when I was starved in Auschwitz. So this is what was, meanwhile, they take us to the ghetto. Now the gendarmes, the Hungarian gendarmes, April, uh, after, after, um, soon after Pesach, it was very early in April, I don't remember the date. 44. 44. Take us. You have, I don't know, a half an hour to pack out. Leave your house. Leave your house. Take what with you? Uh, one valise per person. Now, there was the poor Jewish cook, my mother and I, so we took three valises. What hurts me in a different way than, than that other things hurt is when they whipped us through the main street in town. It was a very beautiful street. The park was on one side and the stores, you know, it was like Fifth Avenue 
on the other side. And people, and as we were approaching wherever they were taking us, there were little houses, curtains moved, eyes peered out. We were driven like cattle into the ghetto. Do you remember the feeling? Oh, yes. Then? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I wrote about it. What's the feeling? Awful. It's worse now than it was then. Because, because it was, there was hope then. It's worse now. What was the feeling? Why? Why? What's going on? What's going on? Why? I was young, you know, and he, you know, here an 18-year-old girl is infinitely more, is educated in a different way. I wasn't a philosopher, I was a good student, but what did I learn? I learned about wars, I don't know, in, in Persepolis. I learned about uh, philosophy. Um, I didn't even have philosophy. I was going to have it in college. You know, I just didn't know why, why? What did your mother feel? She was so quiet. She was so quiet. She was just hold in that march through the main place, to the main street. She was just holding on to me, just holding on to me. It was terrible. Was there any feeling of betrayal? Not yet. Totally ignorant. We were totally ignorant. I found out about Evian and about um, the Bermuda Conference and about all the other conferences and the promises. And I ne we never knew about that. Now and then, some sturdy fellow dared listening to BBC. And the news this time were good. The Russians are beating the Germans, right? So we are going to be saved in the nick of time. We were not. Are you angry at that time? Yes, I am. At the Hungarian people? Very who, much. You remember that? Oh, yes. Because if I would have known then what I know now, I think I would have, we didn't have a partisan underground. We had nothing, nothing. It was hopeless and we were helpless, but, didn't, but we didn't know that it was hopeless. I might have joined the way they did it in, in, in the Warsaw Ghetto. My brother, who eventually came back from Russia, would have joined. We would have run into, we wouldn't have stayed and waited. Yes, I am very angry. I am very angry. I'm very angry, and I'm very angry that if the powers, the Western powers, would have wanted, they could have saved 750,000 Hungarian Jews in total. I'm very angry because I saw those planes flying over Auschwitz, and we ran out, and we yelled, give it to them. We thought, I'm sorry, I'm getting very emotional. We saw that they were English planes. We couldn't see whose planes they were. Today I know they were American planes. And we ran out from our koyas, from our wherever we were housed, and we yelled, come on, give it to them, Gert Tomic, give it to them. They just flew over us very nicely. They could have bombed the railways. They could have done something. And do you know what hurts me the most? A very strange thing. Eichmann came in 1944, March 19, because I like history and I've been reading particularly about the Shoah and what went on before. I find out that the great Roosevelt, for whom we wept when we heard that he, cried, that he died, a year, about a year later, Uh, set up a board called the Refugee Board, whereby he informed, by that time it was very well known throughout Europe and in America. It was known since 1942 when Gerhard, uh, I forgot his second name, when he had all the documents. He was a, a Jewish uh, agency person in Switzerland. Uh, Roosevelt 
established the refugee board and he advised each and every government to stop the killing because they will have to pay for it. <laughs> this was on March 25, 1944. Eichmann walked in on March 19, 1944. So it was like giving oxygen to a corpse. That hurts. I want you to take me into the ghetto. We sleep on the floor because we are now three, the maid, mother, and I. My other brother's little girl, Aniko, is in another part of the ghetto. And we do sort of come together. Food is not available except except what the Hungarian peasants bring at the door, at the, at the entrance of the ghetto. No money, but a diamond ring, and they'll give you this much. Oh, yes. OK? And we are in the ghetto around the end of April, early May, and then comes the total deportation. We were, they woke us up at 5 o'clock. My mother woke me up said, we have to go. I said, where? Where? We have to go. Just get dressed. Get as much on you as you can. We have to go. Now, policemen go from Jewish policemen. I mean, they, were, they had no choice. I have to say it. I didn't think so then. Are you angry at them? Of course I was. Of course I was. Are you now? No. Because? They had no choice. They had no choice. With a gun in the back of your neck, show me the hero. Do you think the gendarmes knew what was going to happen to you? Some, I'm not sure. But they loved doing whatever they did. I'm not sure that they knew. But they just knew that we are going to get rid of the filthy Jews. These and are Hungarian gendarmes? The Hungarian gendarmes. I still don't see an SS or, or a German soldier. Policemen, Hungarian police, Hungarian gendarmes, and the Jewish policemen. Now, we are in line with Roji, my sister-in-law. I don't mean my sister-in-law. Yes, yes, she your is. Sister, yes, exactly. Your, your brother's wife. My brother's wife and this little Annika. In your her, niece. my little niece, whom the first grandchild of my mother's, whom I adored. She always laughed. She always and she 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 had a lovely little coat, um, Pepita. I don't know the word for it in English. It's black and white. A very sweet little coat which was made for her with a little velvet black color. And she was saying, Bobita, Bobita, you know. And then I took, but, but we, we didn't know what was going on. We didn't know they were going to take us to the train. We didn't know ignorance. And if we would have known, it was too late. Now, then I look at my mother. And I said, Mommy, did you put on your fashni, your bandages for your leg? Oh, she said, ah, forget it. I said, no. Who knows what you need them? I am going back. Because I know, you know, we only had one room. When can, where, where can it be? I go back. One of the Jewish policemen stops me, says, Miss, where are you running? I said, look, my mother, da, 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 da. He lets me. I go back. I find it, and as I am about to leave, I see a little crystal, crystal a bowl with cookies. Now, I remember those cookies because we must have brought them in, and I remembered the, the bowl. And I want to go back to take them, but I don't want to miss my mother. And I left it there. That bowl of cookies haunted me throughout my starvation. We don't know where we are going, but eventually we see it. And this is when the jasmine smell from my house hits me. And I begin, and I begin to cry. You remember that? Yes, I remember that. 
I still didn't like crying. It was such a beautiful day. The sun shone. The mountains, the, 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 the blue, the, the trees were in bloom. And then we see the train. We are at the train station. And what do you think? I don't know what to think. I don't know what to think. What's going on? Am I crazy? Is the world crazy? What have I done? Why? Why? 